So first things first, the exam is on parts one through three, and you can have one three by five note card. Please make sure you use the three by five note card. I always threaten that I'll come around with a pair of scissors and cut anything to that size if it's not, um, but just do that for me. Uh, if you need a three by five note card, I have extras in my office. Okay, so let's go through each part and sort of talk about what was important. So part one, in part one we had a lot of definitions. So this particular section is going to be very heavy on the multiple choice, as you saw with the homework as well. The first set of definitions we saw, called SSPP, this is the uh, sample statistic population and parameter. This is going to be on the exam for sure. This breakdown. So all three, uh, all four of these definitions. You've seen a lot of ways I can ask this. One is I just give you a, a little question and say, it, "What is this? Is this a statistic or a parameter?" Um, another one is that Goldilocks question we saw about the televisions uh, in that one cahoot. So there's a lot of ways I can ask this, but usually it's as simple as a multiple choice and just remembering statistic and parameter are measurements, and they are measurements from the sample and population, respectively. The next question you're going to see out of part one is you're going to see something on our sampling methods, specifically um, something related to those big four, right? We had our SRS, our systematic, our stratified, and our cluster. SRS is really lame, boring. It's just random pulling names out of a hat, a random number generator, something of that sort. There is no grouping, nothing more, uh, more exciting happening. Systematic, we know this is where we're looking for every Kth item, so every 13th, every 10th, whatever it might be. Now, stratified and clustered, this is the only thing from part one that I would consider putting on your note card. If you get these two mixed up, if you had trouble on the part one homework, I might consider putting these two on there and making sure you have your definitions. In a stratified, this is when we pick people from each group. Usually here our groups are similar in nature and when we're taking a little bit from each of them. This is the better of the two sampling methods here. Our cluster is when we pick entire groups. So once we pick a group, then we take all the people in it, and usually your keyword here is all. Now you can't be too uh, specific about looking for all because in a stratified we pick people from all of the different groups, right? We do it from each of them. So don't just look for those keywords. Look instead for this, did I pick people or did I pick groups? And that's the piece that's going to help you out. Next thing we talked about in part one was, ooh, I didn't switch colors, uh, were the sampling biases. We had three that were defined for us. Though this is not comprehensive, just like our sampling methods, there were more as well. Under coverage, response, and non-response. And spotting these on a test, if I decide to do this as a multiple choice question, pretty straightforward. They are exactly like what they sound like. Uh, response is when the responses might be incorrect or biased. Non-response is when people choose not to respond. And under coverage is when we did a poor job of covering everyone. We, we left out groups of the population. So um, this multiple choice, the biggest thing to keep in uh, track of on those multiple choice questions is you want to look for the most prominent source of bias. So as you're reading those questions, be very conscious that it's not necessarily um, that this is a type of bias that's going to be there, but it's what it, what am I asking the question for? Did I talk about people not responding? Did I mention a group that was left out, or did I give a specific population and a specific sample and they don't really match up? So think about that one from the test writing perspective instead of from a, well, I bet people wouldn't respond type of area. So those three. Um, the, this question, by the way, is one that you might also see the sampling bias question.
in a free response. This would be similar to that airline question on the homework one. So I could definitely give you a situation and then ask you just free response, what are some of the things that you see that are wrong with this sample? And then it's almost more of a common sense question than a true sampling bias question. I'd rather not have you say under coverage, I'd rather have you say, well, they only looked at flights on Thanksgiving, which leaves out every other time of the year. Instead of using stats jargon, I'd rather see more common sense on something like that. All right, so what's next? Next, we talked about, I think it went straight to experiment versus observational study. So this is definitely a possible test question. Uh, you saw this in your um, knowledge checks. Just a quick, like, is this an experiment or observational study? It was in homework one. So being able to identify, did we give them a treatment or did we not? Did we just observe them? So you know the difference. Um, and that's all you have to keep track of for, the, for those types of questions to be able to tell the difference there. Um, within experiments, we have two more things that we need to be worried about. Experimental design. This was our uh, completely randomized. Our block design. And our match pair. Again, this would be similar to my sampling method question where I just give you a situation and say which type of experimental design was employed. Um, here, just keep in mind, blocking is when we do our grouping, right? So there's some sort of grouping before the random assignment into the experiment. So just know that. Um, and in this question, if I did put this on the test, uh, usually one of the wrong answers is going to be one of the sampling methods, especially block. It is very similar to a stratified, and so I'll put that as a wrong answer, and a lot of students will end up choosing it, even though stratified is a sampling method and not an experimental design method. The next thing about experiments is we need to know all the experimental lingo. We practiced this a bunch on homework one, but the big pieces of the experimental lingo, determining our response, this was our outcome, right? Figuring out what our explanatory variables. Explanatory, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Explanatory. Variables and or factors. What do we think might influence that response? Um, what else do we have? We had the number of treatments. I mean, I could easily ask questions about things um, being blinded or placebos. So just a general overview of that experimental lingo would probably go pretty far. But again, that's, that's maybe one question, so don't, don't kill yourself with it. Don't waste any note card space with it. Uh, just make sure you feel pretty comfortable it was on the homework and in the lecture notes. Uh, the last two things in this section of the lecture notes were observational methods, observational studies designs where we had our perspective, retrospective, uh, and cross-sectional. Uh, again, not a huge, huge deal to know the differences, um, and they are kind of like what they sound like. Retrospective, right? We look into the past. Prospective, we look into the future. Uh, if I asked a question about observational studies, it would only be about these two. So as long as you know those two and they are exactly what they sound like, you'll be fine. And then the very last topic was our lurking versus confounding. Variables. And again, I think that if I were to ask any questions about this, um, that it would likely be a similar to the sampling bias question, some sort of free response type question uh, where it's, it's mostly a common sense thing. Uh, you actually saw one of these in part three, uh, the homework three, if you, if you got there, it was the only one I didn't give you in the answer key, which was like, what's another possible explanation for this relationship or this correlation we're seeing? Um, so you're essentially coming up with a confounding or a lurking variable in that case. So that's part one. Run through everything that happened, everything you need to know, and a little bit overview of how I might test it. Next, we move on to part two.
right, so part two is all about how we could look at data. So first things first, telling apart categorical versus quantitative data. Pretty straightforward situation, but definitely something I could put on the test. Um, I usually like to ask these questions similar to one of the multiple choice you saw at the end of the homework two, where I will say, which type of graph? Some variable. And that's when you have to kind of come down to that idea of, well, for categorical variables, we talked about pie charts and bar charts. For quantitative variables, we learned about histograms, stem and leaf plots, box plots, dot plots, right? So we had a bunch of different plots for quantitative and only really two for categorical. And if we really wanted to expand this to get into almost part three type stuff, these are all for one categorical or one quantitative variable. And we also have ways to look at two cats, two categorical variables. This would be like a split or a stacked bar chart versus two quantitative. This is when you saw your um, scatter plot in part three. This is ugly, I can't stand the handwriting. Two quantitative scatter plot. And if you wanted to compare a categorical versus a quantitative, that's when you could use something like a box plot because then you could look at the regions of a wine and the case price. Right, regions would be categorical, case prices would be quantitative, and that's when you have your little, for this region here, or so this thing, so we can compare with a box plot, um, categorical versus quantitative. So, not something I would waste no card space on. Personally, I would just think common sense, like does, which of these could actually make sense for this particular type of variable, um, and, and just brainstorm it. But if you want to, you could throw something like this on your note card. You don't want your note card to be too full because I am, um, I write long tests. And so you want to make sure that you have the ability to get through everything on your note card. And it's easy to navigate. It shouldn't be a bunch of really tiny writing. It should be just some main formulas and maybe some sentences for the interpretations from part three. Um, from our graphs, let's just talk quickly. I'm not going to make you make a histogram but you need to know how to read it. Like in the homework, find percentages, what percent of people spent more than this amount on a haircut, those types of questions. You wanna be able to uh, discuss the shape of the histogram, which is our modes, symmetry, and unusual observations. A lot of you guys missed points on this question on homework too, because you didn't define all three pieces of shape. Um, so being able to identify those from a given histogram. So the histogram will be given, you will have to maybe answer some questions based on that histogram. Um, box plots, stem plots, all that stuff. Box plot first, you know this is super important. This is our warm and fuzzy. Hopefully you got homework too back for me because if you made any mistakes making box plots, you need to know before the exam so you don't make them again. Uh, you might even want to make little notes on your note card of like those mistakes that you did make so you don't make them again. This is going to be like a 10 point question at the very least on the test and you don't want to drop a letter grade because you don't know the box plots. So uh, remember with the box plots on your note card, here's probably your first piece of note card stuff. You're going to have your fence formulas, Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR and Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR. So you want to make sure you have those. You may even want to sneak on that IQR formula, Q3 minus Q1, so you have that as well. So this is the first, like, guaranteed, should be on your note card thing, I would say. Um, in addition to the warm and fuzzy where you make me a box plot, there'll also be a given box plot. Where I'll ask you to interpret or look at. Um, so again, you can find percents. I could ask you, you know, what's the cutoff where 25% would be above this value? Um, I could ask you questions about the shape still. You can't tell the, sh the modes, but you can tell symmetry from a box plot um, or something's unusual. Um, I can ask you to compare 
We've seen a lot of this. So this was all over uh, your homework, all over the lecture notes. Um, so if I give you a box plot, can you answer questions about it? So we had two other displays. We had dot plots and we had stem plots. These two do not worry too much about. The only way I'd probably use them on the test is one, having you tell me some stuff about them. I only want to use red for my note card stuff. Having you tell me something about them. Um, but this might be how I give you data. Right, just like we saw in some of the box plot questions, rather than giving out a list of data, I put the data in a stem plot and said, from this stem plot, make me a box plot. So um, more likely than anything, if you see these, it's either going to be a quick kind of common sense, like what's going on in this graph question, or a here's a way for me to give you the data without writing down all of the data points. So that's all of our displays. Um, and after that, we moved into our descriptive stats. So we went to, um, actually, another note card thing. Oops. 100% should be on your note card, that little two by two table with um, our measures of center and spread. We've got our, for our symmetric data and our skewed data or data with outliers. Uh, we know we should have the mean and the standard deviation for nice pretty symmetric data like our beautiful normal curves, like our z-scores. And for skewed data, we will use the median because the middle value is not as resistant to outliers and we'll use the IQR because that middle half is again resistant to outliers. We could even add one more piece to this and we would pretty much sum up everything we did in part uh, in part three in part two and that is our outliers. We started out really subjective in terms of deciding if something was an outlier just looking at a graph and saying it looks pretty unusual it looks far away from average um, and eventually we got some numeric measures for that as well. For symmetric data, this was z-scores. And for our skewed data, this was our fences, using our fences for the cutoffs. Um, so there's always a question on the test about which measure to use. Just pay close attention, grab this, like figure out, am I talking about symmetric and center? And then grab mean. Uh, just read carefully so that you're answering the right question. There's always a question on there about how does something impact something else. So this would be like how does a high outlier impact the mean. So this may be a whale tail question, okay, that high outlier is going to pull my mean over, right? Um, it could be a question about how outlier affects standard deviation, how outlier affects IQR. Um, so a general understanding of those four measures is really important to understand uh, or answer this question. I love to have a thing that's just like, do you really know what standard deviation is? or what it's measuring, or IQR, and what it is and what it's measuring. Um, and I do that usually with those sort of evil, true, false questions you saw at the end of homework, too, that a lot of people missed. And also those questions that were on the um, box plot worksheet as well. All right, so then we also have our, uh, our z-score question. You know that's coming. And we talked about the two ways that that can get asked, um, unusual versus better. And that's that's pretty much it. I can't think of much else besides that. Uh, Z-scores and then just generally understanding these because I'll ask a, a couple of questions in that in that second section. Perfect. All right, so that's part two. Last section we need to talk about is part three. Our uh, correlation and regression section. So we'll just start with linear regression. That worksheet was a really good source of things that we would need to be able to do from part three. Uh, first things first, you're going to need to make your interpretations. You need to be able to interpret both the slope and the correlation coefficient. 
possibly also the y-intercept. Um, but these top two are the most important. No matter what, these two, put them on your note card. Put those sentences if you've had any trouble or those things are not exactly uh, what you expected. So those two things should go on your note card for sure. Um, from the regression line, we can also do a bunch of calculations. And remember, we talked about this in class. When you're taking numeric things from the linear regression uh, section, there's really six different things that can come up. Go ahead and write them off to the side here. We have our real x, our real y, our y hat, our e, our r, and our r hat, our r squared. So these are true explanatory and true response. So this would be just for one person. What is their actual explanatory variable? What is their response? Um, y hat is our predicted response based on the regression line. E is our residual. R is the correlation coefficient. And R squared is our coefficient of determination. So there's only three things that you might have to calculate, and you did all three of them on the first page of that regression worksheet. So it's a great resource. Um, I only really asked a lot about residual on the homework and one time finding actual Y. So that regression worksheet is actually a better place, in my opinion, to go for these calculate questions. Three things you're going to have to calculate. Y hat, E, and actual Y given R E. And just remember, these are usually those two-step questions. Step one, find y hat, which is about plugging into your line. Step two, use that residual formula. So this might be on your note card as a reminder that those are those two steps. And especially, no matter what, you need to have that residual formula on there because you will want it on the note card, on the test. You'll need that. So that's a lot of the, what you can do with the actual line itself. Uh, next, I want to break down a little bit of R versus R squared because I know that those two can be sort of an issue. So R and R squared. Uh, we have their names. R is the correlation coefficient. R squared is our coefficient of determination. Students have a lot of trouble keeping them apart, uh, apart from each other. So little r is almost always, and I will always give it as a decimal. It is always between negative 1 and 1, whereas r squared is almost always given as a percent. There are some software programs that give it out as a decimal, but on test, I will give it as a percent. Uh, so it is always then bounded, oops, these can be equal, bounded between 0 and 100%. Okay, so we got what they are and what their bounds are, right? What do they do? Little r measures the strength and direction of a linear relationship. All right, that's, that's what it can do. It can tell us how strong a relationship is and what direction it's going, whether it's positive or negative. R squared measures the predictive power of our line. And we do have ways to think about these things. So closer to negative 1 or 1 is stronger for our little r, and closer to 100% is stronger or better predictive power for our R-squared, which makes sense. And we do have calculations here that we might want to put on our note card. Little, oh, li, okay, little r is equal to um, the square root of our squared. We want to make sure that we get the same sign on our little r as on our slope, because once we've squared r, we lose its positive or negative nature, and so we need to go figure out that what that was, either from the scatter plot or from the slope, telling us how that trend went, and then make sure that we enter the R squared as a decimal. 
uh, big R squared, you're just going to take little r, square it, and then turn it into a percentage. So we got our, our calculations. Um, there's one more tricky thing that I'll mention here about our little r versus our r squared, um, and that is that our r squared here, I was just thinking about a question. All right, and this is our r squared is the percent of variation explained. How much does our line explain about our outcome? So um, that's just one way when you see that wording, a lot of students get stuck because they don't know what they're being asked for, but it's just a fancy pants way for me to ask you for R squared. And then of course, there's the ability for me to ask you questions. You'll see it in the old exam. That's what my brain got stuck for a second. Like what happens if I add this point? Is that gonna make my R squared, what's gonna happen to it? So. Again, you're just thinking closer to trend versus further from trend. So it's really understanding of this piece about strength and that predictive power is all about how close things are to the line. So, uh, and I could definitely give you scatter plots and ask you to match them just like we did in the homework. We can see that this is stronger than the previous one. And if we added a point out here, it would make it weaker and therefore make our correlation coefficient lower. So we have all these, these types of questions I can ask on the test as well. Um, there's one more piece that happened in part three that I need to mention, uh, three things really. One is I could of course give you scatter plots. Uh, with the scatter plot, I could ask you to describe trend. I could ask you to match it to a correlation coefficient. So that's a possibility. Uh, we also had a bunch of different definitions that happened towards the end. We had our um, influential points our outliers and leverage. So you may want to go back and take a look at that video if you don't remember those. Uh, but those would be a smaller point. That would be like one question at most on that topic. So hopefully that makes you feel um, a little bit better about all the stuff we covered. You got to kind of see it again. Um, and I talked about how I would test it. Uh, if you have questions while you're studying, email me. I can always make quick videos to explain something that was not clear. Um, and then I have office hours.